So Kafkas have just in the last couple of days released this domestic abuse practice policy and uh, I've just recorded a 50 minute video going through every single paragraph and I hadn't turned the microphone on <laughs> so I'm, I'm feeling one exhausted and two completely annoyed with myself and um, so this I'm going to redo it but I'm going to be a lot faster um, which um, I apologize about but I just yeah, I don't have the energy to go through it in the same depth. So essentially, you know, it's this is a policy to provide accountability. That's what they're saying. Um, and it's, it's, it's come off the back of the harm report from 2000, um, which, you know, in itself, whilst I, whilst I don't disagree with the points in it, what I disagree strongly with is the gender biased a narrative within it um the things that they say about you know the trauma responses and the way victims are treated yeah absolutely my point is that male victims have the same problems and are completely overlooked i mean obviously they do talk about it but you know it's, that is barely lip service so that's my concern with this and having read through it and done 50 minute analysis on it that you will never ever get to hear you poor people and um, then i yeah it's coming guys this is there's some good bits and there's some really horrible awful bits so you know it starts off okay you know children being children being important um and central to the work that kafkas do um now, it does say listen to children. I get, you know, I'm going to caveat that with we need to be very clear on what what is the children's views and what is the children being in a loyalty bond and being emotionally manipulated. Um, but yeah, I'm fine. Obviously, I'm fine with children being the center of it. They absolutely should be. So, purpose is um, what Kafka's practitioners and managers who are working with children and adults who've experienced domestic abuse and are victims of domestic abuse under Domestic Abuse Act 2021. Um, everyone must adhere to it. Um, and it, essentially, it's a starting point for all of the, the work. You, you, you can hear it in my voice, can't you? <laughs> um, anyway, so practitioners will make it clear in their assessments if they consider a child to be a victim of domestic abuse. So, yeah, absolutely. Domestic Abuse um, Act says that they're a victim if they have seen it, heard it, or experienced the effects of it. And this is the bit that I'm a little bit um, reticent about. Um, yes, domestic abuse absolutely has an effect on an individual and how they parent. Of course it does. And I'm glad that that's acknowledged. My concern is that it the it, that's a that's it feels like an open door to saying, well, I've experienced it that I feel that I'm a victim, therefore I am a victim. Which anyone who knows anything about cluster B personality disorders, that is their mindset. If I feel it, it must be true. Um, and I, I my concern is that that plays into that mindset. Um, so this is about being specific about what's already happened, further risk of harm and the impact of lived with, unified, reunified or spend time with a domestically abusive parent. Um, and the, it talks about the impact on the parent victim and their capacity and safety if they're having to manage real or potential contact. Okay, so my, my concern here is... I understand it and I, you know, I work with and in the counselling um, arm of the company. We work with lots of victims who are attempting to parallel parent with these, with abusive exes, whether they're male or female. And yeah, it is awful. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's hard work. It can feel impossible. You're constantly threatened. But by working with the counsellors, so many of them have found that it's, it's manageable. And I think what my concern is here is we're not putting any, oh, is that the right word? We're not 
putting any responsibility on um, someone who has experienced domestic abuse to heal, to seek therapy, to overcome and manage um, their trauma and their anxiety. I am not saying they should be thrown to... um, thrown to the wolves by the way not at all I I, I 100% think that it needs to be taken into consideration what a I'm going to use I'm using air quotes you can't see them but um what co-parenting looks like um and the reality of that but I do think we cannot just say oh you're a victim therefore you should never have to deal with this person again because it's the child it's the messaging to the child uh, that I'm, again, I'm, I'm conscious of not wanting to, you know, give children a message that it's okay to, you know, domestically abuse. But equally, um, I'm very conscious of the fact that in, in there are false allegations of domestic abuse made. That's fact. People make false allegations of domestic abuse. Men make false allegations. Women make false allegations. You know, it, it happens. And so someone who's made a false allegation of domestic abuse saying I can't deal with them and I never want to see them again is their own inter- internal trauma from their own childhood and their, their personality and um, often personality disorder and they're already emotionally manipulating the children to this point that being, giving them the freedom to say, "Oh, you don't, have, you don't have to have anything to do with them. They're an awful person. You should, you know, you shouldn't have anything to do with them." Is telling the child, you know, it, it's reaffirming this false narrative. Now, I'm not saying that I have a solution to that because I do think it's a very difficult thing to manage. I'm just saying I do think that this, this, there's potential opportunities for abusers to use this. Like I say, male and female abusers to use this just by saying, I feel X, therefore it must be true, is, well, it's not really how things, it's not helpful and it because it's, it, it, it's open for abusers. There needs to be more analysis um, and whilst there is some good stuff in this about that, it to me it lacks greatly on how we how do we determine when someone is a victim of domestic abuse and when someone is fabricating and making false allegations and ultimately spoiler alert this is this document very much like the um responding to parental allegations of parental alienation document is very much just believe if someone says they're a victim of domestic abuse you've got to believe it and um don't ask too many questions kind of thing and and again I, this is such a complex subject that i'm not saying i have the answers i'm just saying that these kind of things feel like they are blueprints for abusers they just literally they get their hands on this and they know step by step how to how to stop contact. And it's the same with the uh, responding to um, allegations of parental alienation document that was the consultation document. It was the same. It was, if we do find parental alienation, then there's probably not not a lot we can do. And it might not even be in the child's best interest if we do do anything. So, you know, it's not that bad. Essentially, (laughs) even though it's domestic abuse, it's not that bad. So anyway, that's that's the spoiler alert on this is it's very much a, of that vein um pretty much saying yeah don't ask too many questions that's what it feels like i might be wrong i might have i might have a very negative perspective of it and i'm open to hearing your views on it as well but i do feel that it's a blueprint for abusers um and i also I just want to point out that are all abuse victims going to be treated equally? Because we know Darvo happens in these cases. Cases I work in happens in every single case. So, how are we going to decide what is a what is a genuine allegation versus what 
isn't. If we're taking all allegations of domestic abuse seriously, are we taking all allegations of domestic abuse seriously? Or are we only taking domestic abuse allegations seriously if they're from a particular gender or whether they've got custody of the children or, you know, I, I think this believe all victims is fine if you do believe all victims, but there's a lot of caveats within that. There's a lot between the lines um, and that that is very concerning. Um, I'm aware that I have some biases in this and I feel quite, I feel very sad when I read this and, and I say that consultation document that it feels very much like men are being written out. And that's not just from a personal perspective of, you know, loving my dad and actually having a much easier and healthier relationship with my dad than I did with my mum. So I, I come from that perspective. Also, my, my brother is a father and I want to protect him. I have relatives um, who are struggling in this arena, being, you know, being made victims. And so I want to protect them. And equally, um, I know children need both parents. Um, I studied, when I was doing my social work degree, I studied um, Charles Murray's The Underclass. And they, and you see this happening now, you know, it's, he prophesies it very well, is a society where, fa- where children are fatherless is far more harmful and dangerous. You know, there's knife crime, there's... Um, teenage pregnancies, there's um, the poorer academic, both females and males, poorer academic results. It's not healthy for children not to have fathers in their lives. And it does feel very much at the moment that, that this isn't just about unsafe because there, there's a feeling of all men are unsafe, which is simply not true. Um, and children without fathers, are higher risk and so we're just we're creating a a more harmful place for children and that's always been my priority so you know that's my that is my bias I I own that bias and I do try and always you know I I think an awareness of the bias means you can you can see that and I always try and look at it from all perspectives but that is where I'm coming in from Um, so practitioners must continuously reflect and learn um, and basically undergo training, which is the next column. So yeah, absolutely reflect. What I would add here is learn about boundaries. And I mean, learn about transference, understand how abusers get you to align with them, how you become emotionally seduced by the tales that abusers spin so that you are not carried away on emotion you are you you stay attuned to fact and you keep the child at the center of it that has to be included in training as does alienated behaviors which isn't listed on here which again i think is quite telling although they will probably say in practice in um domestic abuse that it is in the guidance so you know that might be their argument we do come to parental alienation later which is a when an adult describes a sexual offence or other criminal acts of violence, former child, formal child protection actually must be taken in the form of a 16A risk assessment report. So, um, yeah, I'm all for having a specific risk assessment. This is my um, thoughts on that, though. Are they going to be specifically trained to recognise um, sexual abusive behaviours and assess that risk? When I was um, a social worker, I did... I've believe it was a a three or a four day maybe even a week full week training on sexual offenders we did role plays we um watched videos of abusers uh, and sexual offenders talking about how they did it we we learned the psychology the risk factors within their childhood within their we really got to know all the context around sexual abuse so even if the evidence was questionable which it often is it's particularly in child sexual abuse but even in adult to adult sexual abuse it's often your word versus my word um so what we did the training that we had was about what is there in their behaviors and actually we do talk about this in this document which is one of the very good parts of it but what are, are their behaviours and attitudes 
towards sex, towards human beings, towards um, entitlement. And, I mean, they're just three. There's a, it was huge. It was a really, it was really comprehensive training. Are the our Kafka's officers, whether they be guardians or FCs, are they going to undergo the same level of training? Because otherwise, we massively run the risk of them getting this very wrong. And again, being led by their emotions rather than facts. And by facts, I, I don't just mean, you know, what we can what we can prove by forensics. I mean facts as in, like, say, what their attitudes towards sex, what their attitudes towards marriage, what their attitudes towards children. It, it get, it, like I say, very comprehensive training. I would hope that they would be doing something very similar to that if they're going to be responsible for assessing sexual offenders. Um, when there has been a report disclosure of any form of domestic abuse, including any sexual offence, and the child is living with the accused, the parent, practitioners must urgently assess the child's safety and welfare, grounding this in an understanding of the accused parent's attitudes and behaviour. So that's what I was talking about, okay. So it's interesting that this is the um, living with the accused parent. So, um, yeah, that is, are we talking change of residency here? And I think we do discuss a bit of that later. Um, assessments are informed by what is known at the time and the court will need to see how practice direction 20, uh, 12J has been applied to the evidence, which should be carefully set out. In practitioner report. So the other thing that's coming clear through this is practitioners' reports are going to get more in depth, which is a good thing from both angles because it's you know you want it to be as um, what's the word I'm looking for comprehensive and watertight as possible when you're dealing with an abuser because they're going to cross examine you if you have a fact find um, and. If they're going to appeal, you can't, you know, you, you literally need to make sure there are no cracks. So the more information that they can put in, the better. Um, so I think that's good. I, I mean, I, I have always been quite disappointed in the reports that they, they lack any real investigative nature. It feels very much just uh, parroting in a lot of times, but maybe that's my own professional, maybe arrogance a little bit of feeling I could do something better. I'll reflect upon that. In considering recommendation for family time where there has been domestic abuse, practitioners cannot reliably predict what will be safe for a child. However, they can and must assess the child's safety and welfare, grounding this in the child's experience and the evidence and information that is provided. Um, so again, practice directives, 12J. For example, a parent being investigated by the police for a sexual offence. Okay. As a conviction for a sexual offence or a prison find the starting point to for recognition that the child is not spending time. So I'm fine with the um has a conviction and a served prison time. I'm fine with that. I think this being investigated, whilst I understand it, I'm not I, I would be cautious that we again we're creating a blueprint um for abusers to say to make this allegation. Again. This happens in female and female relationships, female and male relationships, male and male relationships. Men make allegations against women. Women make allegations against men. This is not gender. This is behavioural. I think that if they're just being in, and I say just, I'm not belittling it, but if they are at this point where they're being investigated and there's no outcome from that, this not to spend time... I, 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 that, yeah, that makes me very uncomfortable because, like I say, it feels like a blueprint of, there you go, boom, don't spend any time. Where it, Actually, what would be more beneficial, particularly when there is where it's a false allegation, which it happens, um, then the child is left with an abusive parent and the healthy parent is cut out of their life completely. So, yeah. Protecting victims of domestic abuse, any departure from the starting point must be supported by compelling. Okay. In long running or repeated proceedings, practitioners must reflect and take out previous history and patterns of behaviour. 
Okay, so um, yeah, I've been saying this for a long time that um, the history of the relationship and the historical patterns of their behaviours can be really useful um, in trying to ascertain genuine abuse from fabricated um, abuse. And so, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm all for this. Let's look at the history and look at the pattern. Also, where are there gaps? Where are there, well, where is there a difference? So where one parent describes one situation, or like the entire history of the relationship is described completely different by one parent and to the other. What's the motivation for that? What is the truth? Trying to, the, the gaps, you know, any gaps, there we go, can, this is my, where the gold is. Where's the, what is that gap and why? What is the motivation for there being a difference? Um, as enshrined in the Domestic Abuse Act, abusive behaviour is considered domestic abuse, whether it consists of a single incident or a pattern of behaviour. So this bit I, re I remember I was concerned about because of reactive abuse. I know, and I've done it myself, um, you react sometimes, you've, you're so frustrated and you're at the end, you know, you are literally at the end. You, you cannot cope anymore. You've tried it. You tried to keep it in your head. You've tried to logically work your way through it. You tried to emotionally dumb it all down, but it's bubbling away inside you. And at some point, boom, it comes out. And that might only be a one-off incident. Does that mean I'm a domestic abuser? Well, yeah, according to this, on one occasion, I did something and therefore I'm a domestic abuser. I think what it has to be important here is what it's against. So is it reactive abuse, i.e. is there a history of, um, or is the, are they, is the person that's done this one-off incident, is, it a back, is there a backdrop? Um, of abuse against them okay nuance ask questions it's bigger so the picture is a lot bigger practitioners must not inter reinterpret or reword the experience of domestic abuse victims and must use their own words i totally agree with this um i mean it uses the uh, example of an adult describing rape must not be reinterpreted as non-consensual sex or unwanted sexual attention. Okay, so talking about the R word, um, you um, men under the coerced sex can be victims of R as well. And it's important that we remember that and do not minimise men's experience equally we don't minimize coerced sex as not being a sexual offense um i mean without going into too much i personally have experienced it and i i wouldn't i personally wouldn't class it as rape towards me and that's just my own i'm not saying anyone and that's not for anyone else i wouldn't class it as that myself but it was part of a it was part of some other concerning behaviours, put it that way. Um, but I do think that we it needs to be very clear here that uh, men can equally be victims of sexual abuse within the relationship, and it, so not to genderise that. Uh, practitioners must not use claims of... Uh, must not use language, it just claims to allege it. So I remember I was quite concerned about this until I carried on reading, um, where it says she or he said or she or she told me and i totally agree with that i think it works for when there's false allegations being made and you're wanting to cross-examine um either kafkas or um the person making the allegations against you having it in their own words is much more powerful so i totally agree with this um it has to be in their words i've always said that i've always been very frustrated by whether they be contact reports or um reports which are 
too opinion based they are too they've been, been interpreted and my thing was always my my training my my process was always as much as possible use their words and only write fact so even down to if you i couldn't say was happy because that's an interpretation i would have to describe they had a big smile on their face or they had a smile on their face because even big can be so it was literally that's how i worked is this something that i if i was stood in court and they said how did you know they were happy i used the words that i would then describe how i would describe the say i knew they were happy do it like that and i don't see that enough um so hopefully this will um push that Right, so practitioners must describe someone as anxious or suffering mental health unless clinically diagnosed. Okay, so my my comment about this was, I'm fine with that. What I would say is that anxiety and fear can also, these. I mean, these sound very, I'll be honest, more feminine. Anxious or fear, you know, you imagine the old, oh, oh, I'm so scared. Sorry, and I don't mean that in any way offensive. I'm just saying how I'm interpreting their description I think it's really important to know that anxiety and fear can also show up as anger and frustration, which is equally a trauma response. And the bottom line is both parties are coming from a place of trauma. The work of family court is to know, is this trauma created in the here and now, in this relationship, in you know the post-separation and the, the uh, pre-existing relationship, or is this childhood trauma that is being replayed here that's their job but knowing and again that requires a lot of understanding um but understanding how trauma shows up i think we need to gender neutralize this a little bit more in my opinion again do tell me what you think practitioners must provide a clear unequivocal and compelling rationale in their Reports for discounting domestic abuse as a risk to children when recommending time with or live with arrangements such uh, when such abuse and harm has been shared. Uh, again, just going back to this, has been shared. No, I think we need to have has been proven. Um, because this essentially that is reading as if you're if someone's been um, someone accuses you of domestic abuse you're not seeing your kids or you're not having any time with or live with with your kids and that's not that is wrong because it's the child is being if it's a false allegation the child is being left with an abusive parent and that's far more harmful so very very dodgy dangerous ground petitions must declare in their analysis the understand they've gained during the assessment of the cultural context yeah the balance between our safeguarding policies and their cultural um, nuances has to be, you know, it's a difficult one. It's one we've struggled with a lot. Victoria Climbier being a prime example of that. Um, in fact, finding hearing is being recommended along with the um, 16A risk assessment and referral to local authority children's social care service. Consideration must also be given as to whether it's in the child interest to continue any direct time with arrangements that are already in place between the child and the parent said to have, said to have perpetrated the abuse until the fact finding hearing given the delays you know that's again quite concerning um because the concern again when read in conjunction with the consultation document on um, allegations of uh, parental abuse you can see how this is being lined up of Allegation made, contact stops, wait till fact find. Fact find could take a year at the moment. A year away from a parent who hasn't done anything in the all custody of a parent who is emotionally abusing them and encouraging them to reject the other parent. Then you flip into the consultation where when, you know, when it, no, fact finding says actually that none of this happened and we believe it is alienation. You then go to the consultation, which said, yeah, it's probably best not to rock the boat. You know, you're probably better off leaving the kid as where they are uh, because it's going to be very traumatic for them to move. So we, you can see how this is lined up to cut. I'm going to say fathers, but actually I know mothers 
in this situation as well. So it's going to, what's going to happen is it's going to cut out healthy parents who are victims of abuse. Practitioners must never recommend parental supervision. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, parents shouldn't supervise contact. Equally, though, they shouldn't be able to have full veto over who can supervise because otherwise they'll just say, no, they can't do it, they can't do it, they can't do it, they can't do it, and contact won't happen. So at some point, the court has to say, look, contact is happening. If you don't choose someone, we will, and it'll be this person. Um, practitioners must not support or recommend any contact or spending time when the resident parent and child are currently living in a refuge. Um, so whilst I totally understand um, the safety element of this, not just for them, but for other people in the refuge, my concern is refuges will be used as this stepping stone. Equally, there are so few refugee, refugee, refuges for men that this, again, is a very gendered paragraph. Um, so, yeah, huge concerns around that. Because, again, you know, any time we're basically saying contact can 100% be stopped and not happen at all, we're jumping into the consultation document, which is, oh, let's just leave it as it is, and that parent is cut out of a child's life. Like I said, I totally understand the principle of it, and yes, genuine people in refugee refuges do need to be protected. I just think it's giving a blueprint for abusers. Practitioners must also understand and respect when victims of abuse may take time to describe and share what's happened to them, particularly men who nine times out of ten don't necessarily see what they've experienced as being um, domestic abuse because it's not really talked about, is it? We know exactly what it's like for women, but it's not really talked about for men. So I think, again, I just wouldn't, when they're having any training on domestic abuse, I would like equal, 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 equal time to and understanding to be given male victims. It cannot be this almost 90% it, oh, and men sometimes are victims, but because the majority of women will just talk about women victims because it's just wrong. It is because we're not protecting children, because fathers are important to children. Uh, practitioners should remain open, thoughtful, and okay. So, what I wanted to say about this section was empathy with boundaries. I genuinely believe, and this is from my personal experience, that if we taught um, practitioners the importance of emotional boundaries and how abusers use their emotions and um, love bomb them, how they emotionally influence them we'd stop a lot of this alignment of practitioners with abusers. So I think, yes, empathy is absolutely imperative, but empathy with boundaries, and this is for victims as well as practitioners, have empathy, but make sure you know when someone's... Be empathetic, but don't let them overtake your emotions and feel for them, because that's when you're in your rescuer energy and you, you, you basically ignore all facts and only see them as a victim when that for abusers that's not they're, they're, they're masters at that when assessing the re reasons why a child does not want to see a parent um especially when the non-resident parent alleged parental alienation practitioners must first consider whether the cause of this refusal is because the child is a victim or harmful parenting so um well again that's probably not much different to what it is now the difference being this whole document is essentially saying if someone says they're a victim, then they are a victim. And therefore, they're almost trying to wipe parental alienation off the face of the earth. It doesn't exist. Therefore, what do men, how do men counter them being cut out of their child's lives? Um, and, and this final bit is that, you know, it's just so sad. Um I mean, it's true, you know, you do have to assess, but when it's when someone is accused of domestic abuse and actually they're the victim, 
men and women, we know Dalva exists, being forced to recognise the harm their behaviour has caused their victims, take a responsibility for it, sustain change in their attitude and resulted in assessment. You know, it's it's a difficult pill to swallow for them and, and more abuse. Um, so, get, so for genuine... Genuine victims who have been falsely accused. Uh, this is painful. Um, in considering recommendation for family time when there's been a report, report of sexual offence, practitioners must assess the child's safety and welfare. Again, attitudes and behaviours. I totally, I totally understand that. And like I say, as, as long as the person doing that assessment has a really solid training in sexual offenders and what their attitudes and behaviours really are like. The, uh, what I'm concerned is this attitude and behaviour is someone saying, I didn't do it. That alone, we, we need to dig deeper. We need to so all offenders are going to say, I didn't do it. To figure out which ones did and which ones didn't requires skill and training to be able to ask the right questions, to have a framework and that, you know, there is one on my website that you can buy, which is what I took from that training. Um, and I've, I've put it into a sequence for you to understand, you know, how do you assess whether someone's a, a sex offender or not? Um, so anyway, that's my that's my report of it. And I cut it down by, what, 14 minutes. So hopefully you can hear this one. And uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Um, pull me up on anything. I'm eager to learn if I've made mistakes and let me know. Um, I've probably missed some stuff because, like I said, I did do a 50-minute one before. This is a little bit more rushed. And I'll probably reread it at some point and find something else. This is literally, I've just opened it this morning and gone through it with you. Granted, this is the second time I've gone through it. Um, but, yeah, let me know what you think. And if you are struggling with a case um, like this that any of my words have resonated with, do check out the website, www.getcaughtready.co.uk. Um, our court prep toolkit is specifically designed for parents in this position. Um, and I will be, in, in the Facebook group, I will be adding this, this document and this video as well. Um, so, yeah, take care, everyone.